shirt. <laughs> All right. We are live. Welcome back, everybody, to the Green Party series out of Illinois. I am your host, David Rich. My normal co-host, uh, Calvin Tomashko, has fallen ill, so he won't be joining us. He's kind of behind the scenes doing the producing here. Um, and we have tonight a special guest for sure. Uh, a, a little bit more of an acquaintance of mine. I like to say she's my friend of sorts. We don't really hang out a lot, but I mean, you know, <laughs> we get along well. But we need to. But we need to, absolutely. Uh, State Representative Joyce Mason from District 61. How are you? I'm, I'm well, thanks. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. So just a little backstory to how we know each other on my radio show, Reality Radio. Uh, she's been on my show two, three times? I, I think twice. I think twice. Maybe three times. Um, once in the studio, once on the phone, and I can't remember if there's a third one. But, um, yeah, it's always great talking to you because, you know, you are – right there in the thick of the general assembly in illinois and what's going on and all sorts of things are going on especially over the last year or two with COVID and the police reform i remember last time i had you on we talked about that um yeah. so this show is specifically you know for and about the green party and the the our platforms and that kind of thing which is i don't know what you know about it but it's uh it's a third part it's the of the two largest third parties the libertarian is also the green party as well um, Ralph Nader was a, one of our candidates once a long time ago. They kind of put our name on the board, if you will. Um, this recently we had a Howie Hawkins run. Jill Stein was kind of a big deal uh, back in the day, and uh, it's a very leftist, uh, progressive organization. And um, you know, very so. There's a lot of sympathies and a lot of overlaps with the Democratic progressives for sure. Uh, just about nothing with Republicans of any ilk. Um, so, and that's fine by me. Um, so the libertarians can have the Republicans anyway. So Joyce, thank you so much for coming on the show. So we're not going to talk about police reform. I don't think we're not going to talk about much because we're going to talk mostly about Illinois legislators, the Greek, the general assembly and what is going on concerning agriculture, energy issues, climate change, things of that nature. So just, just pollution, couple. just a couple little pesky things that might not, might not be relevant to anybody, but, um, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of hand the baton over to you. Why don't you go ahead and take, start wherever you'd like, unless you would like me to pick an issue. Well, I'm going to pick an issue. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, <laughs> okay. okay, so first I'm wearing my green Illinois shirt Yay. today. Um, and then actually, interesting story, when uh, Jill Stein was leading the recount, um for an election you know yeah i remember that mm -hmm. i actually went to wisconsin and oh did our lights just get darker yes that was weird do you think you could turn those lights on really? <laughs> sorry that was strange i think i think there's another storm coming or something i'm, I'm looking outside my window there's supposed to be a thunderstorm coming so yeah. yeah so ladies and gentlemen if everything just shuts down don't fear we'll see you next week okay go ahead Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I went and I was one of the um, the recounters. So, just, oh. you know, which was a pretty fascinating thing for a uh, fascinating story for another day, right? So, I'm. Could you give us a sixty second or less summary of what happened? I would always wonder, like, when I'm doing like you're like one, two, three, huh? Ah, uh -huh. oh. oh, crap! One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Like Keno I was in Kenosha, and mm. um, so we were watching the clerk's office was doing the actual counting. Yeah. Watch, and we could, you know, ask questions about yeah. what they're doing. But the most fascinating thing to me, and a little terrifying, is like, you know, they'd bring in a counting machine, and they would say, well, you know, the seal on this machine is broken. And then they would go, oh, well, here's Joe, the 80-year-old um, uh, election judge. And he signed an affidavit saying that uh, they had to replace the cartridge and they didn't have new seals. So they just used, you know, they didn't reseal it. And the same thing with the bags of ballots. They would come in with the bags of ballots and, you know, the election judge at the end of the night seals it and signs it on this thing. And some of them would be broken. Oh, well, George, you know, he signed an affidavit saying they forgot to put one ballot in. So they stuck it in and it's all good. And he signed an affidavit. So there's nothing to see here. So that was really fascinating to me. And um, fascinating so, is a good word. Yeah. Yeah. I'll <laughs> anyway, so, um, so gosh, it was, I, 
it's been a good year for environmental stuff, I think. Not good enough, though, because we're still waiting on the big energy environment bill that originally was supposed to be all environmental you know, CJA, the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And um, it slowly somehow evolved into an an energy bill more than an environment bill. And some of us had to take a step back and say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Ener- environment has to be first. Yeah. No just- environment, no energy concerns. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So- no, nothing, actually. Yeah. It- stalled because I think some people are moving the finish line a little bit. Um, I'm still hoping that we can go back this summer and pass something that's good. Um, but I have I have some notes here about what's in it and you know where it was at the last stages. But it does it does include right now kind of a big nuclear bailout, which frustrates me. Uh yeah. And I understand, you know, like when we talked about the law enforcement bill that, you know, there's there has to be compromise and, you know, sides have to agree. And I get that. But um, but, you know, our nuclear power plants are getting a whole lot of money, which is particularly hard for me to swallow, given that Zion is in my community. Oh, and, yeah. You know, they have the decommissioned nuclear power plant. Yep. Mm-hmm. Still, you know, all the jobs were lost. So many stores and restaurants and everything closed um, when they closed, and people were left unemployed. Um, they have some of the highest property taxes in the state, even though it's some Zion. Of- yeah, because percentage-wise, they have to pay more to try to make up the difference to fund their schools. And everything, and so they're the the lower income paying the highest property tax percentages um, because they're not getting the income that they had when the nuclear power plant was up and booming, and they have all of the nuclear waste or nuclear whatever materials still underground there. So no. is there? They don't want to live there, and so it's hard for me to say okay, I'm going to get on board with this that's bailing out other nuclear power plants um, and keeping them up and running um, with extra money from the state when I know what it's going to be like for those communities when they decide to leave. That being said, the environmental people, you know, say, well, it's a deal we have to make in order to, you know, be able to eliminate carbon by a certain date, you know, do all of the other things that we need to do. Um, And, you know, there's a debate whether nuclear is clean energy. I mean, technically it is clean energy, right? But not in the sense that it doesn't produce any carbon emissions. Yes, exactly. It's It's not safe. Right, right. In Zion, we still... It's on the shoreline of one of the greatest sources of drinking water for how many of us in the area. So, um, and it's buried there and our shores are er- eroding. See, that's just a, can I say something? Well, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to Abdul Jones, Rob D. Rich, who are both uh, commenting on the show. So thanks for tuning in, guys. And uh, Rob D. Rich is saying, I've been seeing the Save the Nuclear Plants signs in rural Illinois, too. Illinois. I just said Illinois. I should never do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, yeah. uh, so thanks for, for thanks for that, guys. Um, I just want to say something real quick. So I've had people on my radio show concerning uh, talking about nuclear uh, energy and that kind of thing. We've had people on this show talking about it as well. Um, and for both sides having their positives and their negatives and that kind of thing, you know, pro and anti, there's one thing on the anti side, and you just alluded to it. Uh, that that I think I always when I ask them this question, I've never heard anybody who's pro nuclear power plant ever say anything other than that's a really good point. Um, and that is the environment, the, the, the earth is always in flux, it's always changing, it's always moving. Where there are no fault lines now, there may be one in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years, in 100 years. We don't know. That's how the earth works. Um, so wherever you build a nuclear power plant, even if it seems super safe right now, in 50 years, it might not be a safe place for it at all. And with the whole climate change, the erosion of our shores, 
yada yada wildfires and storms could be becoming more intense and you can even throw terrorist attacks in there if you want i mean there's a great deal of uncertainty about <laughs> nuclear power plants and their and their safety in the long term and you have to think long term especially when it comes to nuclear energy because if those things break it's over um, and the, you know, I think you know Biden wants to build like two, uh, build like two hundred and forty across the nation or something. Like that. That's crazy. Really? Something like that. that. Don't quote me on that number, but it's whatever. It could be. It could be three, and it's three too many. I mean, whatever it is, he's he's very pro like mini nuclear thing. And I have a buddy who's a PhD in physics, and he loves the idea. I um, mean, I bring up this whole thing about the environment being in flux. He's like, "Yeah, you're right." He's like, "I don't have an answer to that." I'm like, "All right, well then, no nuclear power plants." Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I get it. I, I realize it's a huge source of energy, but, but that's it, the problem too. It's a, it's the most bang for your buck. I mean, it produces a ton of energy. Sorry. Yeah. All sorts of things happening around here. So. Oh, you're a busy person. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. So no, it produces a, a great deal of energy if, for sure. I mean, it's good Lord. It's nuclear. I mean, see what, see what the, you know, nuclear bombs do. I mean, that gives you a taste of what's happening. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I think solar, wind, that, or that. What hydro? Nobody seems to be talking. Everybody's talking about like, because solar and wind, <laughs> Uh, put together, you know, so a lot of people say only account for X percent, X percentage of the energy needs that we have, um, and it's not enough. Um, and I think we just had somebody on a couple weeks ago who actually has a solar panel company who even said it's not going to cut, do all of it, but it's going to take away, it's going to help a lot. Um, but, but what about hydro, too, and using water and that kind of thing? There's so many, there's literally an infinite amount of energy in the universe, okay? <laughs> we just need to figure out how to use it. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I was reading something about um, hydropower and um, working with the tides mm -hmm. in the oceans and even in the big lakes, you know, have mm. a percent of tides and the energy that can be created from that. And I thought that was pretty cool. You just need something to turn those turbines. That's all you need. You need something to turn the turbines. Okay, <laughs> so... so. <laughs> You know, we, we get a make a make a big giant robot that can just sit here and turn the turbines. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, anyway, okay. So, okay, so that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. So that so in Illinois, the the nuclear thing is kind of going uh, going places, huh? Yeah, well, and you know, there are quite a few jobs at nuclear power plants as well. So, like, yeah. I talked to Representative David Walter in his district. You know his whole community, a lot of them are employed by the nuclear power plant. So I understand, right. you know, why those folks would want to fight for their jobs. The yeah. thing um, about this humongous piece of legislation is that we include something called just transitions. And it actually includes um, the funding necessary and the mechanism ne mechanisms necessary to be able to transition people from coal, from nuclear, from, you know, the energy sources that we're trying to get away from and um, train people and actually move them into new green energy. So we're no longer leaving people high and dry, right? We're trying to, um, you know, retrain them and give opportunities. And so I think that that's a really important piece of this. That's a massively important piece of this. And that's part of Joe Biden's infrastructure plan as well. And I was going to ask you if you could sort of elaborate on what that looks like within legislation, because that's an interesting thing. He's like, look, I'm going to switch you over from whatever job you're doing now to a green job. And people are like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Am I, am I, Gonna get a phone call saying I'm now hired at the new, you know, solar plant or whatever. And if I do, I mean, you know, how does that? So, you know, I'm gonna give you a job that you don't have to apply for. I mean, what does it look like? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so it it ensures that there are a certain number of jobs in in each field, in areas, um, in communities, particularly communities that have been most impacted by things like coal and decommissioned nuclear power plants. So it's actually regulating that this is where the jobs need to be created and then includes funding for 
education and training programs working oftentimes with like the trades and the labor unions and stuff um, to be able to retrain the workforce. So um, it's, it's funding that education for people who need it in those communities. So like in Zion, again, for an example, you might have funding for a program that is maybe, um, you know, partially through, say, the, the College of Lake County, you know, sponsors something there and the Lake County building trades or something working together. And, um, and it's being funded so that people in the community can come be trained and then get jobs in the expanded fields that we are opening up as part of the the new green energy that we're introducing. That was kind of rambly. Did that make sense at all? No, yeah, it makes total sense. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, you know, putting, putting the training where it's needed, not just saying like, hey, we're going to open up a new solar farm and hey it's going to be great you go out and get a college education or get whatever training you need and come work there it's going to be like hey we are opening up this kind of energy here and guess what because you're a community that's been impacted um, negatively by having a coal plant that's closing down like in waukegan or, um, you know, a decommissioned nuclear power plant in Zion. Um, we are specifically going to reach out to you and give you, if you want it, free training, free developmental opportunities to come. And then we're going to help place you in this new field. That's okay. Great. Thank you for explaining that. No, seriously, because I think a lot of people are kind of confused over what that means. Like, what does that look like? You know, and they think of it as a politician, you know, talking the talk, but not, you know, you're promising things that politicians tend to not follow through on, uh, you know, so, uh, so thank you for explaining that. It's very cool. Just real quick, Jack Ailey's on there. That's the gentleman who actually owns the uh, uh, solar panel company that we had on the show a few weeks ago. He says, as you probably know, the solar industry is really hurting. We need the SREC program restarted. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? The SREC? Uh, help me out, Jack. Is that, is that? Jack, can you tell us, can you spell out the acronym? Because I don't know what that means. Um, but thank you for chiming in. And Rob D. Rich also said in those same places, the rural places he was talking about before, where you see in the signs for, uh, say, the nuclear plants, it says, I see windmills, but the farmers aren't in favor of them. I think it's the taxes that they are against. I don't know. Um, and that's another part of it, too. I think a lot of people perceive these uh, these issues as like, you know, uh, merely through economics and, you know, labor and work and money, instead of seeing that the importance of the issue is far more greater than all of that. Um, when it comes to energy usage and climate change, what we'll get to in a minute, um, agriculture uses and stuff like that, solar renewable energy credits. That's what SREC stands for, solar renewable energy credits. Yeah. So that was, that was something, and Jack out there, correct me if I'm wrong. That was something that that was introduced as part of FIJA, which was p before my time, right? Um, which is preceded now CJA, which is what what some iteration of that we're hoping to pass. And um, those do expire, so we are in jeopardy of hurting the, the solar industry. And Jack can probably explain this better than I can. But this is something, actually, another reason why we need to pass legislation sooner rather than later, because that would be included in this new legislation or re-upping of those credits um, so that, that we can... So currently there are none? You know, I, I don't think they've expired yet. But I think it's coming, and I apologize. So is this the stuff I see on Facebook? Like, you know, oh, Illinois residents get free solar uh, energy, blah, blah, blah. Is that this one? So I'm one of those all scams. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not yes to them being scams. No, yes, that's what you see. And also credits for, um, for companies and, you know, larger community solar um, as opposed to just you or I putting solar panel panels on the house. And by the way, I want to click on those on Facebook and I'm never really sure if that's so even I'm I've, 
clicked on a couple and they never seemed to be followed through with any sort of like governmental proper agency or anything like that. So I'm guessing at least some of them are scams. Uh, and Jack just responded, Fija is correct. We have no incentives for customers right now. They ran out in December. Okay, it was December. Yeah, so yeah. we really do have to pass it. <laughs> is is uh, uh, the governor for that kind of stuff? He is actually. He's been super supportive of it and especially uh, supportive of, you know, making sure that we have our deadline for, um, you know, going, um, going to 40% renewable, um, by 2030. I have my notes here because, you know, 40%, going oh, full free by 2035, a hundred percent carbon free by 2045. Um, he's been really, really supportive of that. And, are you getting any pushback from the uh, Republicans? Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, that, that just annoys me. I'm sorry. I mean, that's really, again, these people don't understand the urgency in this stuff. And like, I mean, again, when we get to climate change, I mean, you know, we're not messing around. Okay. The, the top scientists in the world all agree it's happening. Um, at the, you know, the day, you, you, all you got to do is watch the weather. Every year it gets hotter. Every year there's more storms. Every year there's more intensity in the storms. There's more wildfires. The shore, I've seen pictures from NASA in Hawaii. The beach shorelines were this big last year or 10 years ago. Now they're like this big. I mean, you can see it happening. It's ridiculous. The science is in, guys. Okay, I'm tired of these people thinking it's a hoax. I'm tired of them not taking it seriously. It's a dangerous thing to not believe it. Right. Is that say, go ahead. Like, Sorry. Important. No, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think about all the folks that said that like COVID was a hoax, but then they, <laughs> no, they get it or their mom dies from it or something. Yeah. Okay. Ha ha. ha funny hoax. First in line to get their vaccines. Like, you know, <laughs> um, and, and it's scary because our time is limited if we don't do something about this. So, um, you know, we, we have to get on board on this. And I, I understand that again, to get some of these things passed, some concessions, have to be made, but we have to do it quickly. So what kind of pushback are you getting? Like, I, I mean, is it to the extent of like just denying that there's a problem? I'm not talking about climate change. I'm just the energy thing that they're, they're getting to renewable, 40% renewable by 2030. They're like, ah, nonsense. So let's just keep using fossil fuel oils. Those are great. Yeah. I mean, just in general, like, you know, we hear coal is great. Coal is not, you know, not the reason. Um, Coal's terrible. It, it, right. No, I agree. <laughs> if you know, if you look at historically, um, there are just general patterns and it has nothing to do with humans. It's just the way it is. And it's like, no, we are contributing. So, I mean, that's the thing is, is that like what's happening now, the, it's true that again, like the, the earth is in flux. It changes. There's no doubt. And we've seen that we've had ice ages in the past and now we we're not in well, I get that what, what they're saying, but the thing is, is that they can track, like the rate of change over time, like you know, with the ice ages and stuff like that. And since the industrial revolution, it's like this. Okay. And it's in a very short period of time and that is unprecedented. It doesn't sure. happen that quickly. Uh, and we know that carbon emissions uh, ret retain heat, greenhouse gases retain heat, mm -hmm. uh, which is causes the temperature to rise. I mean, the, you know, okay, I'm sorry. Right. This is, <laughs> I'm going to get angry. Oh. <laughs> They're all locked down due to COVID. Do you remember seeing like air was cleaner for a while? Yeah, you saw the satellites images of like the, the 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 pollution in the air went down like considerably. I was like, oh, this is great. That's why I hope this this whole stay at home and work thing like takes out takes us uh, uh, some steep momentum because that would be great. Less cars on the road. Yeah, yeah, we need to. We all have to do everything we can to. Yep. So. Absolutely. So, wait, so uh, forty percent renewable energy by twenty thirty. That's pretty ambitious. Where are we yes. at now? Where are we at now? Um, let's see. Point two. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do we do you get the sense that we maybe have a long way to go to get there? Yeah, yeah, I do. And okay, and you probably some of your experts can can know better than I do. But I'm um, sorry doable. You know, it's absolutely doable, which is why we've set it as a goal. Initially, the legislation had um, a more aggressive goal, but that date has even been pushed back. Um, but you what know, was the more aggressive goal? Uh, I, I, 
I think it was it was uh, 2028 or something. Okay. Like that and coal free by 2030 instead of 2035. Um, so, but you know, if you think about it, it's 2021. We're halfway through 2021. Like that's coming right around the corner. So, oh yeah. No, it's in nine years. I, I plan on still being alive. Me too. So I, it affects. So it affects me. Yeah. Which makes it my business. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> um, is there a lot of coal? Are there a lot? Uh, what about coal uh, uh, mining in, in Illinois? Is there a lot of that? I don't, I don't. You don't hear about that very often. You know, I was really surprised because I really didn't think there there was as much. And um, you know, by the way, in in college, I used to dress up as a coal miner and give tours of the coal mine at the Museum of Science and Industry. How so cute. I should know the whole background of the coal industry right now, you but, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I was surprised there's there's quite a bit of coal in Southern Illinois, which oh, okay. you know kind of explains a lot of our Republican colleagues um, who live in so uh, Southern Illinois and why you see the signs um, well, there are signs to save coal as well as nuclear, depending on where you are, um, you know, and why you have certain politicians with their, you know, we're going to dig and we're going to, you know, do so much with coal, why they're all so in love with coal. But I don't know why they exactly, why are they so obsessed with these forms of <laughs> resources of you? I mean, what, why are they so, is it just the money, the profit? Is it the oil companies and how much money they make? Or they just love like just digging into the earth and destroying it. I mean, I don't get it. It's I so invasive and money. gross. Right? It's probably money. Yeah. There's one, there's one word behind everything wrong in this world and it's profit. Sorry. Okay. I'll say. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> some, of us, some of us of a certain age, you know, may have watched Dallas here and there, like uh, yeah. back in the day. Okay, who I shot JR? Sure. But I saw the commercials, and you know, I mean, it's all about money, right? They're, yeah, you know, that's right. So, real quick, uh, Anna, who is usually one of the producers here on the show, has said we do not have time for gradual policy, and 2050 is too late. Okay. <laughs> uh let's see jack I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't know how to make it any faster though <laughs> that's the, exactly and i'm gonna actually well, let's talk about i want to talk about the difference between uh like say uh the, the market doing it and the government doing it we're going to talk about that in a second jack ailey also said without renewing the incentives we won't get there solar is like one or two percent right now wind is more uh jack also said employment in coal is way down so much more mechanized okay that's just, yeah technology kicks job people out of the jobs that's a great point the use they use those to pretend they are pro workers okay yeah they use those that to pretend they are pro workers gotcha um yeah so um uh, i am not a libertarian i was one for a little while and i got really annoyed very quickly and I, yeah no i just wish i couldn't handle it uh, it's just uh, <laughs> Uh, they have a lot of good points, but not. Uh, they make a lot of bad ones too. Um, so the Green Party is definitely my political home. I just, it's like I agree with everything. Yeah. Um, but one thing I, th I don't think this is actually opposed to the Green Party platform because decentralization and local economics is are two of our platforms. Um, is the notion of like I don't want to like say the free market using it, but just people doing it on their own before having to wait for the government to legislate it. Mm -hmm. Like just companies saying, okay, you know what? Where well, you're right. Oil is bad. An oil company saying, we're going to figure out different ways of doing this. We don't need the legislators to say yes or no. I mean, do you see any of that happening with the bigger companies or are they just milking it for all they can? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So you're talking not on an individual level, just. No, like, well, I don't know. Sure. I guess I mean, like a lot of people are switching to organic gardening and that kind of thing. I mean, I guess those sorts yeah. of things are helpful too. Um, but I mean, more like, you know, just, just people, the, I, mean, I guess I am talking about the market itself, but I mean, just, you know, people within the market saying, you know, we don't need, we, people just not waiting for legislation and just taking it upon themselves to make the appropriate changes to a more green sort of sustainable thing. Yeah. I feel like we're, and I mean, companies are recognizing that that's a popular thing and that people want it. Um, yeah, no, there's that too. Yeah. I, I see that out there, but I also see that, you know, like when I'm looking for 
organic food or, you know, a, a hybrid car or an electric yeah. car. I mean, there's a higher cost right now. So if, if people can't afford it, they might want it. Um, but they might say, well, but not this year, right? I, I want to eat all organic food or I want to drive an electric car, um, but the wallet's going to have to take precedence. So that's really hard on an individual level, I think. Yeah. Um, I was talking with um, somebody who works at um, United Auto Workers earlier today, and we were talking about electric cars. and. Oh how disappointed I was. He, he just got an electric car and um, he was talking about how it goes 300 miles on a charge, but wow. drive like, like, you know, into Missouri or something. And there weren't a whole lot of places where he could charge his car. And so that complicates things. And, yes, it does. you know, I said, we had some legislation this year that required all new construction um, to include charging, you know, locations for cars and the, you know, the um, to be wired that way so that they had the proper hookups and the building industry pushed back so hard on that. And the crazy thing is it costs really very, a very limited amount to a new construction, add these things as opposed to retrofitting things. Better. Like if I want to add a charging station in my garage, it's going to cost a lot of money. But if I build a house, it's not going to be that much because it's going to be just built into the wiring that they're creating to begin with. So, you know, I think we have to really like push back on those people pushing back and make it more of an everyday thing and make it more accessible. And when we make it more accessible, then as the demand grows, the prices will go down and it will become right. an affordable and regular thing for people. Right. So I don't know exactly how to make that happen, but. Well, I mean, I guess that's part of the, part of my, my point or my question is, is that, uh, yeah, I mean, these things can very well happen without, government inter, uh, interference or I don't want to say interference, but, or, you know, uh, action, um, that the market, you're right. The companies are like, okay, look, people want more organic food. Let's build more organic farms and we'll create, create, you know, for the, meet, meet the supply with the demand and we can bring down costs. <clears throat> yeah, I see, uh, you know, in Jewel, where I go shopping, I'm seeing a lot, almost day, weekly, I'd say, I see more organic, their own organic brand items there. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Um, because people want it. I talk, you know, mothers want to feed their kids healthy food. They don't want to feed them, you know, fruits and vegetables with pesticides and chemicals and crap all over it. Okay. And the, rightly so. They shouldn't have, you know, Roundup's a bad thing. Glyphosate's a bad thing. They're getting the crap suit out of them. Monsanto. They should be. Uh, like, so I think it's like 150,000 lawsuits against them right now or something. Um, so yeah, it's crazy. Um, so I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it's good to say that the market is just another way of saying people taking action on their own. You know, through through a co commerce type situation, but it's you know without the government having to come down and say you're going to do this. You know, I I wish that kind of you know wake up one day and you know, think that I'm gonna live a more green life. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How do we make that happen? I mean, you know, the people in our circles, right? That we talk to, we all believe in it and we understand it, and we know that that. Time is ticking and there's a point of return. Um, but then there are lots of people out there that are, you know, wanting to still drive Humvees. And <laughs> oh, I saw a couple of those you like within the last like two weeks. I'm like, are you kidding me? What is with that? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you don't need an army vehicle well, to drive. It's just, <laughs> it's just they're, they're compensating, I assure you. Um, so uh, Jack Ailey also said, we do electric vehicle charging installation. Retrofitting a huge apartment building with charges is a lot more expensive than just building it in in the first place. That makes sense. Yeah. So, right? So, yeah. It's so hard to pass legislation um, saying every time you build a building, just wire it for electric charging stations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, the answer to that is because people who build buildings and, you know, those industries, they, 
have powerful lobbies, right. have lots of money, and they convince legislators that that's not what needs to be done right now. I don't know. I don't know. Is lobbying a problem in Illinois General Assembly, do you think? No. I, I don't think it is any more than anywhere else. You know, um, it's kind of interesting when I when I first started, which wasn't that long ago, you know, mm -hmm. We had our two-day orientation, like everything you need to know about being a legislator. And um, they talked about lobbyists and they said, you know, lobbyists get a bad rap, um, but really look at them as the experts and the people that can really educate you. And the good ones will tell you, like, this is why I'm pushing for X, Y, Z, but this is what the opponents say about X, Y, Z. And they'll still try to convince you, but they'll be really honest. And they said, you know, the lobbyists that don't do that, that lie to you or omit things, don't stick around long, right? Because they get a reputation for being, um, you know, not straightforward. And I have found that to be generally the case that, you know, the ones the ones that I've worked with um, and stuck with come to me and say, okay, you know, here's what we're working on. Um, this is why we want you to vote a certain way. But, um, you know, here's what this industry is going to say. And here's what these opponents are going to say. And, you know, we don't think it's a big deal because of X, Y, Z, whatever. So, so that's been great. But there are some lobbyists that I shy away from. And I think that a lot of times, um, you know, in some of the some of the big big industries, um, they don't necessarily have to say anything other than you know with campaign contributions. So, if somebody's giving you a human contribution, not me, but somebody, and a bill comes up and they say, you know, we really don't like this bill, well, this person's like your, you know, your great friend is giving you so much money, and you know. Some people are swayed by that. So I, I think that that's a problem. I think the, the bigger problem than lobbyists is um, campaign finance. And we need campaign finance reform. Um, these big, huge dollars and crazy expensive elections and campaigns are not, are not good for us. Not it's ridiculous how expensive campaigning is. It's ridiculous. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't, yeah, think that the, the, the basic notion of lobbying, of like people within markets, within industries, within specific companies, sending their experts to Washington or to the capital of a state or whatever to, to uh, explain their needs and wants as an economic node um, to the politicians who are going to make laws about taxes and things concerning them is a bad idea at all. It's a perfect idea, actually. I think that's a very cool thing. It's when the money gets in there, like you know. Oh, by the way, if you if you believe my side of the story, here's a check for your campaign. That needs to go. That's ridiculous. For them to just come say, hey, by the way, I know you guys are voting on this soon. This affects us. This is what. This is our our opinion on the whole thing. This is the data we found. Okay, great. That's awesome. We want the public. We want people to talk to our government. That's what democracy is. Yeah, um, and they so, are experts, and you know we when you look at god we had 4000 bills this session <laughs> she said so many you can't be an expert in everything like you asked me uh you know what's our percentage of renewable energy now i'm like ah, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no and that's okay i mean you know you're right i mean that's the thing we didn't you know, you didn't get voted in as an expert on renewable energy. You got voted in for, you know, probably, probably more uh, general characteristics. Real quick, Anna is saying that Greens do not take any corporate contributions. That's true. Green Party does not take any corporate contributions from anybody. We're uh, we're pure. That's awesome. <laughs> no, I say, you know, but I know that I can call, you know, Jack Darren of Sierra Club or Elaine Neckritz, who is – uh, you know, right. obvious that focuses on on environmental stuff, and I trust. Them. I know yeah. that they're going to to give me the real deal, and then, you know, I've had lobbyists come to me with bills, and I won't name any names, but say, "Hey, Joyce, you know, we really would like your vote on this. Like, yeah, no, the, you know, they, like you are really not going to vote for this this bill, but I need to come to you, so. Um, and I, 
so much. Uh, yeah. Okay, we only got about twenty minutes left here, so I want to talk more. But we talked about energy. Let's yeah. talk about uh, let's talk about agriculture. So I think when I had you on the show before, I I think I mentioned this to you. If I didn't, I certainly should have. Uh, the uh, Illinois is called the Prairie State, right? Uh, at one point, sixty-five percent of Illinois was prairie. Do you know how much of Illinois is prairie now? I do not. Point one percent. No, really. Yes. No, oh, it's awful. Uh, and it's because of uh, commercial farming. It's because of uh, just the major farms out there. They just absolutely destroyed everything. And I understand we need food. I get that. Uh, but major changes, and it does ties totally into climate change because agriculture, destroying topsoil and things like that is a huge uh, uh, thing that helps uh, climate change increase um, all over the world. And so agriculture is very much at the forefront of a lot of different uh, very important issues. If we want to keep our food supply chains flowing we need to tend to this is there anything in the general assembly that they're doing i'm not saying we need to make, replace the prairies per se that's kind of water under the bridge but we definitely need to do something about the farms right now and is there anything going on in the general assembly concerning agriculture well as a matter of fact there is um, yay <laughs> and i have some notes so you know so my tired brain um will you know not have to remember it all you can just but, read it yeah well, <laughs> Item, but um, I have some notes because it was interesting that, you know, one of the biggest things this session in the state budget um, is that for the first time in history, Illinois has dedicated funding to implement the nutri uh, nutrient loss reduction strategy. Um, so that has to do with, you know, polluted runoff from farm fertilizer, um, threatening the health waterways blah 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 sorry mm -hmm. but it includes and i'm just kind of skimming here but um it includes uh the fall covers for spring savings program which provides cover crop insurance discount yeah. um double of what it was last year six hundred and sixty thousand dollars <sighs> Um, soil and water conservation districts funding at 11.5 million, which is an increase of four million dollars from before, um, an extra million dollars to the IEPA to oversee the nutrient loss reduction strategy efforts. And then let's see, we have 2.5 million for disadvantaged and urban farmer programs. Oh. Um, local healthy foods incentives programs for a uh, matching grant for SNAP purchases at farmer's markets. I know that doesn't have to do with prairies, but I'm just reading my points to you. <laughs> um, let's see, 56 million for the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, increased funding for the Department of Natural Resources and Agriculture, uh, conservation and open space programs, um, were fully appropriated uh, originally. I don't know if you heard Governor Pritzker was talking about eliminating them this year. Um, and thank no. goodness he didn't. He fully funded them. So that includes the Open Space Land Acquisition Development Fund or OSLAD grants, uh, Natural Areas Acquisition, uh, Acquisition Fund and Open Lands <laughs> fund so okay so there's that's a lot of stuff there yeah yeah and then there's some more clean water stuff um but but it really was um probably more environmental um more environmental stuff that's than has ever been in an illinois budget before oh wow that, that's encouraging that's good to hear uh is pritzker is he a super huge environmental guy you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, he's been super, he's been super supportive of environmental stuff in general, whether it's the big bill that we're working on now, you know, standing up to the coal plants and things like that, but also for um, conservation. He's been very, very good about conservation and open spaces and parks and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the answer would be yes, although I've not had any in-depth, uh, you know, conversations about exactly. Have you, I'm assuming you've met him. 
you know, yes, yes. I mean, you're, you're a legislator, so is he a nice guy? Yes, very yeah. nice. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't follow him very strictly, but I mean, I, I, he's definitely made some good decisions, I think, and some kind of weird ones. But uh, he made pot legal, so that's okay with me. So, um, you know, when you when you meet him, um, he does not seem like like a you know big bazillionaire. Um, like, oh yeah, he is a bazillionaire. Yeah. He's super genuine, very nice. Down to earth, yeah. I believe he genuinely cares about people. Mm. Um, I know that he had to make really hard decisions during COVID, and I don't think it was easy for him. Um, and I think I told you this the last time we talked, you know, when we we had a, all had a phone call right, right when he kind of did everything, shut everything down and said, you know, people are not, ever going to know how many lives we saved sure. doing this but we're going to do it anyway yeah well that's that's <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway yeah and that means a lot because politically he could have gone in a different direction and right absolutely and then you know it's it's it was a tough situation for any leader of in government at that point that somebody who has to the, the that has to make those sorts of decisions because if you didn't make the right decisions then people start dying and then you get blamed for that and if you made the right decisions then you lock everybody down and they get pissed off at you for that it was a no win so you know <laughs> so have a global pandemic i mean knock on 1918 was the last time yeah. so um, i don't even think that was global to be honest with you um all right. So, what about climate change? I mean, I know that climate change is a global issue, but obviously, you know, everybody needs to do their fair share. I mean, we, you know, cars are, are a big part of it. Uh, manufacturing companies, you know, they pollute, emit greenhouse gases and uh, carbon emissions, and so on. Is there anything the Illinois legislature is doing concerning that specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, going back to this big bill that we're all waiting on, right, um, for for climate change, you know, being able to to go coal free, being able to go car free, okay. Um, okay. those are huge things. Um, one of the sticking points in getting this passed has been shutting down um, Prairie State, which is What's a big that? plant here. It's in a coal plant? Mm-hmm. And it is, I didn't even realize this, it's the state's um, largest polluter and the seventh largest polluter in the country. Yeah. In the country. And like so many of us, this was news to us. We had no idea this was going on sort of in our backyard. So we want this closed. Um, and of course, there's a big pushback against this. So that's one of, I think, the the big sticking points in in getting this legislation passed but a, a, a whole group of us have said there will not be a bill unless we can close this plant so wow yeah what do you think your chances are i i'm super hopeful <laughs> <laughs> all right she's not gonna give an exact number she's just gonna say oh, that's cool no that's okay that's okay it's hard to, it's hard to do Joyce, I get it. You know, I can't even imagine being a politician without compromising something. I mean, you're going to go, you're kind, you're negotiating with alternative uh, opinions and, and perspectives on things. I get that. It's it's just some of these things. I just again, due to the sense of urgency and this, to the grandiose nature of them, like energy and and climate change and all that stuff. I mean, climate change literally affects everybody in the world. I mean, I'm not kidding. You know, and the future of the world and that kind of thing. I mean, this is a real deal here. Okay. Um, and so I don't like to, I, but I, I don't know how else, how else you would get a bill through if you don't compromise. If you could just, you know what I'm saying? I would just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, that's why I don't think I should belong in politics. Cause I'd be like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. You guys are crazy. Um, I'd get kicked out of the general assembly like the first day. I guarantee you. Um, so, <laughs> uh -huh. Um, so we got about 10 minutes left here, and I know that there's some other questions that were being asked that really weren't specifically about climate or anything or environmental or anything. What is the health and vaccination situation within prisons and long-term jailed people awaiting trial in Illinois? What's the situation there? Do you know anything about that? This is Again, this is not stuff that I asked you to prepare for, so don't, don't feel like on the spot at all. No, no, no. I think, I think originally, you know, there was, um, depending on the location, 
I think there were some struggles. Um, I know here in Lake County, um, Sheriff Eidelberg did a great job of ensuring that people coming in were, were um, isolated until they were introduced. And, you know, they had a couple of cases, but not a huge thing. Um, it's my understanding that, um, that those large facilities, whether they're prisons, jails, uh, people were vaccinated, you know, they were on the front lines of being vaccinated. Um, you know, whoever asked the question, correct me if I'm wrong, if you know something, I don't. Um, but, you know, I think the goal right away when the average person was like, why can't I get a vaccination? Why, you know, do I have to wait? Um, it's because they were focusing on congregate, you know, health centers, hospitals, healthcare workers, people in prison, um, prison guards, things like that. So No, I remember there was a bit of controversy over the fact that prisoners were getting it before the general public was. Yeah. Uh, because people of the general public want to dismiss prisoners as just useless. Uh, but I think, you know, we see them still as people. Um, so, you know. You know, I'm not saying if you're guilty, you deserve not to have it. But, you know, we have so many people sitting in prisons just waiting for their a trial. Court, right. And they're, you know, there are people out there that are just fine condemning them. Um, right. And that's not okay. But, you know, no, it's even, not okay. Even if you are convicted, um, you're still a person to live in a healthy. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, you're probably in jail because you acted out not like a person at some point. You know, that's the whole idea. Um, not like a human being. Um, but you are still a person. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, will you or have you joined striking workers picket lines? I have in the past, yeah. All right. Joyce is a hellraiser here. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, well, I've, I've picketed with teachers. I have gone out to um, when some of the healthcare workers and the nursing homes were, were having issues. I've walked with them. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else in recent times but yeah no i'm i'm totally supportive of of people being able to exercise their right to to bargain and and strike if necessary is yeah uh, is illinois generally a very pro union say obviously cook county is very blue um because yeah. i mean cities tend to be that way but uh, do you think generally uh you uh illinois is I think so. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's that's one reason why, you know, Governor Rauner's agenda to crush the unions and uh, make it a right to work, which I call right to work for less money state and less safety protections. Yeah, it's a right to be treated like crap. It's, yeah, that's all it is. You know, um, a right to starve. He failed. <laughs> right. Good. Good. I, I can't. I, I'm very pro union and I can't stand anybody. Who's not? Um, so, okay. So another question is, do you support ranked choice voting? Ah, you know, that's a good question. I've had a couple of people um, ask me about that and I feel like I don't know enough about it. And I know that sounds terrible. I was just listening to, oh gosh, where was it? They just did ranked choice. Uh, Maine. Uh, Maine, yeah. Maine, yeah. And I hadn't really heard, I don't know if the process is done yet, um, I sound very uninformed right now, but it's something that that's I'm okay. Learning. Ranked choice voting can be a little tricky to explain, but basically, basically, it's just you pick instead of just picking one or and that's it. You pick your top three. Rank them and then. <laughs> okay, here's my first choice, second choice, third choice. Um, so even if your first guy doesn't win, you know your vote still counts towards the other ones. You know, perhaps winning or not. You know that kind of thing. Um, so it's just, you know, you know, it's not, again, it's not just, you know, your choice, your vote either counted or it didn't count at all. It kind of like puts it out amongst a multitude of different possibilities so that it counts at least somewhat in some way. Yeah. Which I think is a better idea than just, you know, this binary, like, you know, you know, your guy won or your guy lost and that's it too bad. You now have no representation for the next four years, you know, <laughs> but they should still have representation, right? <laughs> well, they should. <laughs> you're, elected, you're a, a legislator or a mayor or whatever and not a politician right isn't that how it's supposed to be uh yes <laughs> supposed to it, should should is a very interesting word 
my you know what <laughs> Mr. Smith goes to Washington, so I still yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good movie. Good movie. Yeah, exactly. Going, let's all do the right thing. Do you feel like you've been uh, tainted? Has your will been broken at all? Even Barack Obama said it like, during his first term, I think. Maybe his second term. He's like, you um, can't change Washington from within. He's like, you can't do it. Yeah, you know, heartbroken some days. Heartbroken, or, yeah. You no, know, I... I cried in the bathroom one day oh you know, but that's but you just you kind of just do the best you can with with uh within the constraints of the system right and sure. if we all just shrug and go ah this is the way it works um then then we lose we have to and you know as more real people like start getting into politics like has been happening um, you know, people are just kind of fed up and running for office. Um, I think we don't have to accept the way that it's always been, you know, um, I think we can make a new way as much as we can try to do. So I don't know. for sure. Real quick. I just want to catch up on some of the comments here. Jack Haley also said the towns that put up money for that big coal plant should have known better. They made a bad decision and we are being asked to bail them out. If our company, the solar company, makes a bad decision, we don't get a bailout. It's a good point. You know, there's something other, this like libertarian thing about like the government kind of choosing, you know, who's going to get money and who's not, you know. Uh, in a lot of ways, the uh, Obamacare was a good idea, but at the end of the day, it was really just a, a, an insurance mandate. Now, all of a sudden, oh, insurance companies, you're about to make a lot of money because we're going to force the American public to buy your stuff. Eh. Anyway, uh, let's see. Robert D. Rich is saying correction officers were the first to get the vaccination. New York City Mayor Jack Haley is saying that. I'm thinking that has something to do with ranked choice voting. I think they just used that in New York. Uh, there's a link on here for more information about ranked choice, rank choice voting if anybody's interested. Um, yeah, so, okay, only a couple minutes left here. Real quick, I want to ask you for, like, literally a 60-second conversation. Was there any sort of new police reform bill after we talked? Because I know that... One of the frustrations I had when I talked to you last time was that the last minute the, the whole get rid of qualified immunity thing was yanked out of the bill. And that really upset me and a lot of other people, especially a lot of the minorities who get the crap beat out of them by cops. Um, so uh, somebody said it was being put back in or you guys were readdressing it or something like that. Is that true? Um, so, so there was a trailer bill, you know, a follow-up bill, but that didn't address that part. Okay. Um, you know, there was talk about addressing it, but you know there was there was so much pushback that I think that they knew that they wouldn't have the votes to to well, kind I of just, tackle yeah, that. Yeah, right, exactly. And then that's again uh, okay. Um, yeah. uh, we talked about that before. You know, the thing is, is that if, I know you said that you know police chiefs were calling you and stuff like that, saying that you know if you if you got rid of qualified immunity, nobody would want to be a cop and that kind of thing. But, well, you know, this that's a notion like, you know, what you can't be, you don't want to be a cop if you can't get away with beating the hell out of somebody or killing somebody. That's ridiculous. Why would I, why would I want to hire a sociopath in the first place? Anyway, we only have a couple. But they did fix some of the, some of the. Yeah, no, for sure. You guys did some stuff, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that, you know, the sponsors are not going to give up and they're going to continue working. But, you know, the cleanup bill was something that everybody could agree on. And, you know, right. gotcha. problems that politics is hard. I get it. I really do. Jason. I'm not <laughs> trying to make fun of you or mock you or anything like that. Or mock politics. It's a it's a difficult thing. There's a lot of a fight. You, you fight every day of your life. That That's kind of a drag. Uh, but, you know, you're a good person. I think you're doing it all for the right reasons. And that's why I appreciate you. Thank for you. sure. We only have a couple seconds left. Would you like to like uh, espouse yourself at all or promote yourself in any way? Anything coming up here? Or? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Um, it's thank you for having me. And thank you. I have a series of kind of advisory committees that I host every once in a while. So oh. like night just before I was here, I was hosting a Zoom veterans advi advisory committee. Oh, so interesting. Um, you know, I have an environmental one, a women's advisory committee, um, veterans. We're going to start a, a state border one for particularly for like people and businesses living on the border of Wisconsin and the unique challenges that that has. And what I tell these groups is that, you know, I'm just there to listen and mm -hmm. The best legislation that I've written so far have been from ideas that people have brought to me. 
Um, so, you know, give my office a shout, send an email, look on Facebook, and join us. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Everybody, State Representative Joyce Mason of the District 61 in Illinois. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we learned a great deal, and it's always important to, you know, uh, it's one of the things I love about, about Joyce and a lot of the other local politicians is that you're accessible. You're willing to come on to local shows like this and tell the public what's going on, which is really great. Because um, I'm going to go for Pritzker next, and after that, Biden and Harris. See if I can get them out here. <laughs> you can help me with the Pritzker part. Okay. Joyce, thank you so much. Have a good uh, rest of your evening. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Green Party Series of Illinois. I'm your host, David Rich, and hopefully next week we'll have Calvin Tomasco back. Till next time, be good, be green.